Welcome to another episode of Real Christianity. Today we are talking about how to find a biblical church. A lot of people ask us this question on what does it mean to be in a biblical church? And I know you guys know that we plant house churches. That's our ministry at relearnchurch.org. Uh, but we're not going to be talking about specifically how to find house churches. House churches are difficult to find because they uh, don't have websites. <laughs> um, but we are actually working on a solution, hopefully uh, later in 2020, to help more people find those biblical house churches. Until then, um, you're in a local area and you're just looking for a good church mm -hmm. that teaches the Bible. You can have a biblical church that's not inside of a house. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. What do you look for? What are the criteria of a biblical church? So we're going to walk you guys through that. Hopefully this is a really helpful episode for you guys. Um, I think that it's going to be useful in terms of it's not just fluff, but I think really useful for you evaluating if the church that you're at is um, fruitful and biblical. And if you're looking for another church, here's how to do it. So we'll let Veronica start with number one. Well, yeah, before I start with number one, there are seven criteria that we've come up with. Um, and if your church doesn't meet all seven, that's okay. Hopefully, you know, maybe look for five of the seven. Yeah. So we're going to just dive right in. Uh, the first one is expository teaching over topical teaching. Yeah. So I'll dive through some of these and then Veronica will jump in uh, as we go through. I'm going to hit this one. Number one, expository teaching over topical teaching. Um, topical teaching isn't inherently bad. It's not a bad thing. I, I often will do a topical teaching uh, here and there. Um, but since the Bible has become more offensive in the culture, which uh, it has is more politically charged. Many pastors have opted for topical sermons to avoid those politically charged um, portions of scripture. And so we go topical where we only kind of put in a few verses versus expository. We go verse by verse by verse. This is actually probably why you haven't heard a sermon on women in the church and why you haven't heard a sermon on head coverings or why you haven't had a, heard a sermon on divorce because it seems like many pastors just kind of skip those in their... They go around them. They go around them. <laughs> Bob and weaved. Yeah, and it's like sermon series. Yeah. Uh, that's the big popular thing. Is a ser We have a series on this and a series on that. Um, I, I just say it's more important to go through an expository, uh, exegetical, meaning that you're breaking down the scriptures verse by verse, going through a book of the Bible. You're not skipping anything. Um, the goal of, expos of an expository teacher or pastor is not to hear, wow, what an informative lesson or uh, what an uplifting message. Thank you. That, that's not the goal for the expository teacher. Um, what they're looking for is, thank you. Now I understand what that Bible passage is saying. Mm -hmm. I, now I understand my Bible more. It brings clarity to what people are already reading. Yeah, and it makes them feel like, oh, now I know what 1 Corinthians is about. Mm -hmm. um, it's not about, oh, I feel better about myself in this informative, uplifting, motivating message. It's more about, no, I understand God's word with a greater clarity. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the difference between topical and expository. And this is another way of putting this is verse by verse teaching. And, um, you know, we're going to go through, through John. I, I just taught through... First Corinthians, mm -hmm. which took me how long? A year and a half. Year and a half, <laughs> going through, and I could have gone faster, mm -hmm. um, but it took me a year and a half because I went, yeah, verse by verse, and sometimes there would only be a few verses, sometimes it'd be a chunk. There'd be some weeks because we do biblical house church. Um, there'd be some weeks where you wouldn't preach. Yeah. So, but to get through that whole thing, it was about a year and a half. And it's a long book, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, just taking people straight through. You want to look for pastors that taking you straight through God's word not really taking you through their own opinion about a variety of other passages. Uh, I think Acts 20, 26 through 27 is very instructive. Paul's, uh, Paul's talking about um, his time, I forget which church it could be with Corinth. Uh, it says, therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. Verse 27, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God, meaning that he's given the reference back to the Old Testament, proving that Jesus is the Messiah, all the way to the New Testament revelation that he's received from the Holy Spirit. He's given the whole counsel of God. And I think that's just uh, the pastor's job is to really take the sheep through the whole counsel 
uh, of scripture, not to avoid certain passages of scripture or compromise scripture because of the culture's resistance or hostility toward it. Uh, Barna actually just released a study. A friend of mine just text messaged me an image of this yesterday when I was, when I was writing this. Um, it, it was a quote uh, from the research project for, that Barna did recently. 50% of pastors said that they're nervous about offending people by preaching on socially charged issues. Okay, so they're nervous. Uh, they ranked sexual issues, especially related to the LGBTQ, as the number one issues of, he of hesitancy. Which again, sadly, what we're seeing is that, that in culture is influencing the church more than church is influencing the culture. And we're actually compromising the word of God because of the fear of man. Mm -hmm. And so that's coming. Um, and the other thing in this little section that I'm talking about, expository teaching over, ex over topical teaching, one other thing is make sure they're teaching out, a out of formal equivalent Bibles or uh, essentially literal Bibles is another way you might have heard it. We did a, a podcast on this titled, Is Your Bible Translation Reliable, uh, Reliable and Accurate? Um, but the idea is that are they teaching out of the NASB, the King James, the, the New King James, ESV? Um, those are really the four common RSV is another one. Those are the four common formal equivalent, meaning that they are word-for-word -word translations as best as possible to the original Greek manuscripts um, compared to teaching out of the message or teaching out of the NLT or teaching out of the NIV. And so I just say I look for pastors who are teaching expository teachings generally, the majority of the time, and they're teaching out of a formal equivalent Bible meaning that they're looking for a word-for-word -word translation, not a thought-for-thought -thought translation. So that's point number one. Point number two. Biblical authority over cultural celebrity. <laughs> so just because a pastor has the gifts of the Spirit doesn't mean he has this, the fruit of the Spirit. Um, never confuse spiritual giftedness with spiritual maturity. Mm -hmm. That's You see that all over the place today. Credibly gifted people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super gifted people, but it doesn't mean that they're mature. In that are going gifting. and teaching the gospel and then buying a Lamborghini. <laughs> uh, yep. There are many captivating pastors who preach spiritual truths, They have, um, but they have failed to teach those truths themselves. And Jesus called these people hypocrites. Mm -hmm. um, next point I would make is to look for churches who are centered around a uh, diversified group of biblically mature teachers who are looking for... First, to be faithful to the scripture and not to please the hearts of man. You kind of touched on that just a second ago. Yeah, I, I mean, really is that you're looking for men, pastors, elders who are have biblical authority as their focus. The authority comes from the word of God, not cultural celebrity. It's not really about them. You're looking for pastors who have a humble character. Um, they're modest in their appearance. You know, dress nice. You know, wear a wear a suit, maybe wear you know collared shirt. Um, but when you see these pastors today wearing eccentric fashion, um, like I see pastors that are wearing like on stage, they're wearing like you know low cut m shirts for guys with like a leather jacket and like jeans that are half ripped and boots that are leather and and bracelets and necklaces and like it's just so like weird yeah I, it makes me think about um how the scripture i mean it, it's referring a lot to women but to be modest in your apparel and not arranging the hair and wearing gold and it's it's talking it's like, about being modest yeah look at me but look it's at me a man's version of modesty i guess yeah and it's it's really parroting the culture it's not showing kind of a difference in culture being holy which is separate from the culture set apart yeah mm -hmm. set apart it's parroting the culture and it's um it's just not focused on glorifying God. It's focused on glorifying them. And that's really drawing the attention to me and my apparel and the way I dress. And, and showing off their gifting. And showing off their gifting. I've seen this too. I've watched pastors that the way they preach, they like call back to themselves um, and, you know, use this kind of, again, eccentric way of... You know, like, oh, you're going to make me, you're going to make me say this. You're going to make me say this. Oh, I'm going to say it. Like, I just go, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Preach the word of God and stick to the word of God. And don't make it about you. Mm -hmm. 
Make it about God's preaching for the edification of the saints. Um, number three, why don't you read it? Point number three, small <coughs> and strong community over a big and loud community. So point number three, small and strong community over a big and loud community. And that's what you're going to be looking for. That's the criteria number three. And we have to remember that Jesus changed the world with 12 men. Not 1,200, not 12,000, just with 12 guys. And he even had closer relationships with three. Um, Science actually supports that our brains can only be intimate with up to 12 people. And that's a stretch. That's like if you're single. Uh, If you have, you know, you're married and you have kids, that takes up a few of those intimate relationships. Most people are intimate with like three to five people Mm -hmm. where you're actually close with. So the idea of just large is not really um, conducive to how God designed our brains to interact relationally. And the New Testament is filled with uh, this idea of one another's. Um, There's over a hundred of them. Uh, The universal doctrines that we hear, these one another's, are to be played out on the street in our real lives, in our real relationships. And it's very difficult to play out confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed with somebody that you don't know because you're lost in a crowd with 800 people. Mm -hmm. Like the scriptures themselves instruct um, doctrine that is conducive for intimate settings and smaller groups. You can't play out a majority of the commands of scripture in large wide but not deep communities and so you just look at that kind of stuff how are you to fervently love 800 people you know as first peter says to fervently love one another how are you to do that when you don't even know them and so again size necessarily we got to be really careful about this this is why i think one of the criteria small look for small and strong community over big and loud community um and uh you know, you're not looking for consumer Christianity. If you're a biblical Christian, you're, you're looking for contributor Christianity. You're looking to be involved in relationships and participatory relationships with other people. The word in the, in the Greek for fellowship is koinonia, and it means participatory or reciprocating relationship, uh, to have Jesus Christ in common and to participate with each other. And yeah, you're got- not supposed to be there just to consume and consume and consume and constantly be poured into and not have your share in ministry by ministering to other people in Ex- the body. Yeah, I love that. And Francis Chance has a really good quote. He says, going to church should be more like going to the gym and less like going to the movies. And I like that idea is that, yeah, it's it's not a consumer sport. So, Yeah, when you have committed community, you don't necessarily need the crowds. Um, Crowds aren't necessarily a bad thing, um, but they do make it easier for people to hide and make it more difficult for people to connect. Um, And then it's amazing that churches all across America are aiming for the crowds, but then they wonder why nobody feels close. Because it's really hard to hide. (laughs) Really easy to hide, not hard. Really easy to hide, yeah. Yeah, Well, I mean, look at our community, right? Our community, we have 10, 12 families. And it's enough, right? Like, we're just like, wow, like you had a couple more families and it's like, it can be too much. It almost feels like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, but, and then we all gather for fellowship on Sunday and we sit down and we're like, we're so-and-so. Like we notice when people are, aren't there and sure enough, three or four people will text that person. Hey, are you running late? Should we wait for you? Or, um, are you not coming this week? And whatever, you know, they'll yeah. respond and we notice when people aren't there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, ultimately find a church whose um, overseers are looking to grow deep, uh, grow more deep relationships. <laughs> relationships, sorry. Over. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I lost track here. Oh. I think it's a typo. Hang on. Grow deep more than they are looking to grow wide. Okay, look for a church whose overseers are looking to grow deep more than they're looking to grow wide. Ready? Okay. Do just pick up right yeah, there. Yeah, just, just say, yeah, ultimately. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, find a church whose overseers are looking to grow deep 
more than they're looking to grow wide. Um, Dale and I would say that if the church has over 200 people and the leaders aren't looking to immediately plant another church, instead they're looking for a bigger building, um, then there's a good chance that they're focused on the numerical growth rather than the spiritual growth. Yeah, and again, I'm not saying that every single church that's big is bad. Right. That's not what I'm saying. Um, you know, the the there's there are fruitful communities that are big. Mm-hmm. But generally speaking, like like I think what you said is when you have committed community, you don't need the crowds. Mm-hmm. Like crowds are great for evangelism's sake when you're going and doing an outreach event. Mm-hmm. Crowds are good there. But at the end of the day, again, the Bible's doctrines are played out so well in small Mm -hmm. and we're just seeing that in our own walk is that man we can actually fulfill those things imagine trying to fulfill all the things that we do in other people's lives with with other people who we don't really know it's just i think that's why so many people feel Mm -hmm. so distant from each other and so um that's point number three. So I'm going to go through them real quick just as we, we start our, our we review. Uh, number one criteria is expository teaching over topical teaching. Find an expository Bible teacher. John MacArthur uh, at Grace Fellowship or whatever, uh, Grace to You is uh, his, his show. But John MacArthur has got a, a great church, um, and he's an expository teacher. Um, and that's a good example. It's a big church, too. So he doesn't fit all these criteria, but it's an expository teacher. Is John MacArthur perfect? No, but he is an expository teacher. Is he looking for biblical authority over cultural celebrity? Yes. I would say that John MacArthur is an example. John Piper was an example. Biblical authority over cultural celebrity. He actually was lifted to celebrity in terms of the Christian community, but in a revered manner, not in a, like, flashy flashy manner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And then again, small and strong. For small and strong, not big and loud. Number four is biblical elders over financial donors. Mm. And this is something that we remember seeing when you're in the big mega church world is the people who are on the the board. Yeah, we lived in California, so yeah. generally, I mean, not, you know, the, I think this carries all throughout the United States, but it was extra amplified, amplified in Orange County. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know, so first, does the church have elders? That's the first question you should be asking. Um, second, are they qualified according to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1? Go read those passages of scripture and ask the, the people at the church, who are the elders and how are they chosen? Were they chosen because the guy owns a really great business and he makes a big donation to the church? Or was it because he actually meets the qualifications according to scripture? Um, third, are they actually involved in shepherding or is it just like some title with no responsibility involved? And that's how most, I don't want to say most, many churches in America are operating these days is that um, it's just a title. In reality, they're all surrounding the pastor who really is making the lead decisions. Um, I, I would just say you want overseers. A plurality of elders is actually ideal mm-hmm. that you have many of them that are walking this way and actually have roles of shepherding. And there are rules for shepherding, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, fourth, can you have dinner with them? I just would never go to be a part of a biblical community that had elders that I couldn't know because I couldn't actually know if they're actually elders. I want to be able to verify with my own understanding that this man and woman are walking according to what the scriptures say they should walk in order for them to have authority in my life according to what scripture says. And so I'll give you an example of that. Um, Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch over your f- or they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. I mean, there's, this is just one. There's several scriptures on how you can approach an elder. You're, the scriptures say that you cannot bring a reviling accusation against an elder unless you have two or three witnesses. So there's like some biblical roles in terms of how we can re- uh, relate to these men and women. And that's why I go, is there elders? Are they qualified? Um, do they have responsibilities? And can you meet with them? And that's a really important part if you want to find a real biblical community. 
Mm-hmm. And I would even say at a church as big as John MacArthur's, uh, there's definitely elders there. And I'm sure that you could go there and schedule a dinner and eventually get together with some of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, that's just one thing that another point, point number four. So point number five. Discipleship over evangelism. All right. This is a big one because we've seen this a lot. And the church, I think, is almost universally adopted the wrong way. Um, and I don't, even, I don't know if I want to call it the wrong way, but the way that I'm the opposite of wh- how I'm going to teach it. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Western church has turned the internal meeting of the saints uh, into the external work of evangelism. Um, this is seen over and over. I mean, remember when we were at Southern California, it was about evangelism. Mm-hmm. That's what it's about. Um, the scriptures do not forbid evangelism from happening at the local church meeting. Um, but it's not the purpose. It's never the purpose uh, of the meeting is to evangelize and save at the meeting. That's not what you yeah, see people in scripture. The meeting should be people that are already believers. Yes. And they're there to edify one another and to be equipped to go out and do the work of the ministry. Exactly. And that's, you know, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 talks about let all things be done for edification. Um, again, you can't edify somebody who isn't believing in Jesus. You can't even talk about the things of Scripture if they aren't believing in Jesus. Um, and Ephesians 4 says that the purpose of the weekly gathering is to edify believers to do the work of the ministry. It's a place where we get together so that we can be strengthened uh, so that we can go out into the world and do our ministry that the Lord has for us. Uh, I'm trying to think of that quote. I might pull it off my head here. But there's always that quote that people say, oh, the church is a hospital for sinners. Mm-hmm. Um, and I go, no, no, no. The church is um, not a hospital for sinners. It's medical school for the saints. The world is the hospital. We go to church to be trained, to be edified. To be equipped. To be equipped mm-hmm. so that we can go out into the world and do our ministry. Um so uh, evangelism is an outward ministry in scripture. That's just how it's shown. You never see an example of Christians in the Bible inviting people to church to hear the gospel from someone else. That's just, <laughs> that's what churches do today, but it has nothing to do with the Bible of, hey, you go invite some people to come to church and I'll preach the gospel for you at church. That You just don't see that in scripture. The Great Commission even says, go therefore, and make disciples of all nations. It's the idea is that go out and go do that work. Um, and the reason I say this is because when churches become seeker focused, they typically become doctrinally unfocused. Mm-hmm. It becomes centrally about the seeker. Um, the spiritual milk becomes the central element and the spiritual meat, which so many Christians are craving right now, uh, is on, it's, it's always pushed out to the small groups. Mm-hmm. And again, you know, you might get lucky where you have a really mature couple in your small group, but most small groups are just indicative of the maturity of the church. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately in trying to meet the needs of the lost, many churches fail to meet the maturity need of the saved. And that's why in, if you're looking for a church, look for a church that is discipleship focused. They can have outreach things going on. Make sure that Sunday meeting is not about centrally about evangelism but it's about discipleship about bringing people deeper to a deeper understanding and knowledge of jesus christ so that they can go evangelize the other 167 hours that week Mm -hmm. so okay point number six (coughs) family integrated over age segregated ministry Mm -hmm. so um dale and i believe that the bible instructs parents to be the central source of spiritual maturity for their children Um, And it's not something we should be outsourcing. If we are immature in this area, um, it's time for... So I'm going to start that over again. Yeah, that's fine. You clicked it and it went over my thing. Um, Number six, family integrated over age segregated ministry. Um, Dale and I believe that the Bible instructs parents to be the central source of spiritual maturity for their children. Um, And it's not something that should be outsourced. If we're immature in this area or in any area spiritually, then it's time for us to grow, not to offload the work to a youth pastor. Yeah. 
um, in Ephesians 6, cha- or chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Um, there's actually a whole website that will help you find a church that integrates the family into the main service, and it's um, ncfic.org, which stands for the National Center for Family Integrated Churches. Um, it's actually a really good website, and it's really well done. So you, people always think like, oh my gosh, there's not, I'm, I'm never going to be able to find a church that doesn't have like super youth ministry focused. I want, you know, but there are, there's actually hundreds of churches that are adopting a biblical perspective of mm-hmm. family integrated versus age segregated. I actually just quick side note. I actually did um, some Insta stories of what our gathering looks like um, for fellowship on Sundays. And the number one response direct message I got back was, I love that the kids are there. I love that the kids are with you guys. Um, yeah, it's it, definitely something that people are craving. It is. And, you know, what it does require is that when the kids are there, it requires that your children are behaved. And because it's pretty evident if your children don't know how to listen when they're trying to sit in the middle of a meeting, a lot of parents don't know how to train their kids. And so they're just stoked to offload them on Sunday as babysitting so they can go focus at church. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the perspective. It's the wrong perspective to have, but it's it's the perspective. Yeah, and we're not saying that youth ministry is unbiblical. We're just saying that it's extra biblical. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not in the Bible, and it generally supports a parenting posture that is unbiblical as well, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, there's also an article on our website titled, Is Youth Ministry Biblical or Is It an Experiment That's Hurting the Church? Go check that out on relearnchurch.org. Yes, and at the bottom of that article, there's a really good documentary on youth ministry. And um, it's just really well done. It's probably like eight or ten years old now, um, but I just really appreciated uh, that documentary. You might want to watch it. Um, Number seven. So we have the, the, this is the last of the list, and then I'll go back and review it one more time. The seventh criteria is a focus on fruitfulness over productiveness and so look and again it might take you a couple times to go into a gathering to determine if a church is actually fruitful what were you thinking you're about to laugh (laughs) i i saw that it says fruitfulness over productiveness and i said i was thinking in my head fruitfulness over production oh oh, yeah (laughs) over production that's a great point because yeah i mean the church that veronica and i um went to that she was going to before uh, we got married. Man, that production was serious. It was. We also went to another church though together that was just as just as ridiculous, equally as insane in the production. Like I'm talking hundreds of thousands of dollars of like media equipment. Tigers on stage. Tigers on stages. Like girls, sp- sp- you know, <laughs> okay, spinning see. off the off the ceiling because of a concert that they're doing for Jesus. It was crazy. Anyway. Um, anyways, yeah. Back fruitfulness to fruitfulness over productiveness. <laughs> productiveness. Uh, we can confuse spiritual activity with spiritual fruitfulness. So we think just because we're doing a lot of things for Jesus that they're actually yielding fruit. Um, you know, just because we have a lot of programs, because we have a lot of schedules, a lot of ministries that are going on, doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually fruitful. And we need to be watching out for fruitfulness because Jesus says that we'll we'll know a a good tree by its fruit. Mm -hmm. We'll know people by their fruit. I mean, this is something we should be examining each other. If the divorce rates are the same, if the pornography rates are the same, if people are getting drunk on the weekends and using ridiculous language and talking about things they shouldn't watch and Game of Thrones is popular, like if those things are happening, then yeah, that's not a fruitful church um, as a whole. Like you got to just keep an eye out for fruitfulness, for, for a people that are holy, for a people that are trying. Now there's grace, we're not perfect, but, but this is a church that's trying to be holy. Mm-hmm. And trying to walk out the scriptures. Their heart is yielded to scripture. Yes. Mm -hmm. You want to find that. And again, you're not going to find that at a church that's not expository teaching. um, That's teaching through the word of God. Um, And instead, uh, evaluate if people there are wise, as Veronica said, their understanding of scripture. They're just wise people. Wise families. Look at the children. Are they well behaved? Is there really good parents? Are the marriages intact? Are the relationships healthy? Is there correction and exhortation and admonition and rebuke and church discipline? Like you're looking for these things that are all a part of the scriptures and just to see if like 
those kind of things exist. And it's hard to see in a massive community, but when you're in a small community with a 150 people at a small church, these things are pretty quick to evaluate. You can see this over a couple couple weeks. And just because you just mentioned that, I completely agree with what, everything that you shared. But I'd also want to be um, cautious if you're the type of person that is overcritical. Sure. Somebody's child acts out one time. Who knows? Maybe they're two years old and they're in the training stage of life. Sure. Um, or you had a one-off moment with your husband where you started bickering or something um, because there are those people out there and they're, oh, there's that one thing. I'm not going to that church. Yeah. It's better for you to be going somewhere than nowhere. <laughs> it is. And and I would say make sure that, yeah, you're looking for themes. Mm-hmm. Um, Patterns in people's <clears throat> lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're looking for generally this theme in leadership. Mm-hmm. Is the leadership going, uh, trying to teach? Because, yeah, I mean, you, you definitely can hold the pastor accountable for the state of the flock. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's what you do for shepherds. If the flock is mangy and ugly and broken down and sick, um, you don't look at the other sheep. You look at the shepherd and find out what's going on there. And so um, another thing I'll say is for fruitfulness over productiveness is, are they in debt? Are they raising money in donations to go into debt to go buy a building? Um, I, that's just one big red flag. You cannot teach on money as a church if the church itself is in debt. That's just hypocritical. You have no biblical authority to speak on those matters if you yourself are actually in debt on that. And so I know there's controversial views of that, but I mean specifically the church needs to be of a higher level of accountability on matters like this because they are setting the standard for um, for what the scriptures teach. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, we should all be looking to create the most biblically accurate expressions of church. That's what we're looking for. You're looking for a biblically accurate expression of church um, that'll lead you to a more fruitful expression of Christian living. Mm-hmm. That's what you're what you're really looking for. And we have to remember that global saturation, this idea of taking the gospel f- to the far places of the ends of the earth, always begins with local fruitfulness. So if you want to talk about all the ministry that we could do and all the things that need to be get done, none of that happens unless there's local faithfulness. So it can't be true universally if it's not true locally. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's really important that you're looking for churches that are true locally. All this stuff's true locally. So um, let's go back through it real quick. Um, you want to read them? Number one, expository teaching over topical teaching. Two, biblical authority over cultural celebrity. Three, a uh, small and strong community over a big and loud community. Number four, biblical elders over financial donors. Five, discipleship over evangelism. Six, family integrated over age segregated ministry. And the last point, seven, was faithfulness over productiveness. And what she meant to say was fruitfulness over productiveness. Oh, but sorry. faithfulness works <laughs> too. too. Um, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so we have these seven. And again, as Veronica mentioned, if you get like five of the seven, that's good. I, I, we should all be aiming for seven out of seven on this in terms of looking for a church. I would hold our church, our gathering, accountable to all seven of these things here mm-hmm. um, to making sure that we're walking those things out. And um, again, there are still many great Bible-focused church gatherings around the country and around the world. You just do have to go find them. And the more you get into cities, um, it seems like the less you'll find them. They become more and more rare. Um, And uh, our hope is eventually in 2020 uh, to put together a, a national locator of biblical house churches that you could find and become a part of. Uh, it's all going to be a part of a plan that we're doing for a church planting school. So there's lots of stuff going on here. And the reason I say that is because um, if you guys feel so inclined or you feel like the Spirit's leading you to do this, uh, your financial donation is really helpful. And the Lord will provide for his work. And so I'm not worried about it one bit. That's one thing we learned this last year. Mm-hmm. We didn't have a, I didn't have, a, I, we were both down sick for so long. I didn't, couldn't work much. And The Lord just continued to take care of the ministry. Mm -hmm. So, but if you do feel inclined, we have some of these big vision ideas. Building out the website to do that functionality, building out a church planting curriculum, it's not something that's a one-man show. 
we need lots of theological minds around that. Building out a 150,000 square foot building to host workshops. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no, we're talking about an online curriculum that we can build to uh, make it accessible for people all around the world so that they can build up a um, the, the knowledge to plant house churches wherever they're at. And so if you feel so inclined, we would... Um, we would appreciate that, and we promise to be faithful with those funds uh, to direct them towards the past that the Lord has put before us. So on that note, until next week, we will see you guys next week on Real Christianity. Take care.